podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello, welcome, Smart People Podcast listeners. Chris Stemp here. Man, I'm in a great mood. And a lot of it is this episode and the things we got going on at SPP and just you. I mean, for example, we got this really thoughtful email from a listener named Harrison. If you're out there, really appreciate it. But just saying, you know, thanks. I get value. I'm listening to a bunch of your backlog, etc. It makes my day. Additionally, we just got the mock-ups for our new logo and kind of brand identity. I mean, we're taking this thing serious, guys. We're trying to blow it up. So I'm just in the podcast mood. Hope you are too, because we've got a great one for you today. We are speaking with Dr. Annie McKee, specifically about her brand new book, How to Be Happy at Work, The Power of Purpose, Hope, and Friendships. As many of you know, this podcast was born out of a want to be happy at work. John and I quit our corporate gigs and said, how do we just get smart people to tell us what to do? It's funny how far we've come. It's funny how much has changed. And it's funny how much I still care about this topic. So I was so excited to bring this to all of you as we talk about how do you find happiness? How do you take ownership for what happens to you? Do you need to leave your job or do you just need to figure out how to make your current job better? Annie McKee is a best-selling author, a speaker, and an advisor to top global leaders. She is a senior fellow at the University of Pennsylvania, where she teaches and leads the Penn CLO Executive Doctoral Program and the MedEd Master's Program. All right, enjoy this episode with Annie McKee. We are at Smart People Pod on Twitter and also Remember to subscribe, because as you may or may not know, for a brief period of time, we were removed from iTunes for a small glitch in the system, and you couldn't find us unless you were subscribed. That's not a pitch, it's just the truth. As always, remember, if you are loving the show, head on over to smartpeoplepodcast.com slash society, sign up, help us shape this podcast. Here it is, how to be happy at work with Annie McKee. Enjoy. If you could tell the people listening one tip on how to find or how to become happy at work, what would that be? Gosh, that's a really good question. I probably have a lot of answers. The first thing that comes to my mind, Chris, is that if you really want to be happy at work, you've got to love what you do. And there are ways to love what you do, even if it's not perfect right now. When you say even if it's not perfect right now, that means a lot to me. And I'm trying not to put too much of my own self in this. But what does it mean to say it can be perfect right now? It's it's really interesting that in order to be happy at work, to really discover happiness at work, we need three things. We need to feel a sense of purpose that we're having impact on something or someone that matters to us. We need to feel hopeful about our own personal future as well as the organization or the company. And we need friendships. And, you know, it honestly does not matter what we're doing. And I have my own personal experience of this. When I was younger, I was literally cleaning houses and doing those kinds of things for about 10 years in my early adulthood before things changed. And I was miserable, right? Um, I thought I can do more than this, but I needed a job and that's what was available to to me at that time. And I was able to kind of transform how I saw my work, right? And started to take pride in some aspects of the work that were important to me. Um, Part of the job was cooking. I got better at cooking. But most importantly, I found in my employer a mentor and a friend. And those two things, feeling like I was getting better at something, even if it wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I had a friend in this woman who was employing me, gave me hope for the future. And I was able to weather that 
that time. And you know, Chris, there's actually research that backs this up. Some of our colleagues at Yale, Amy Rosniewski in particular, has done some wonderful work looking at people have janitorial jobs, cafeteria jobs, that sort of thing. And we can transform how we see our jobs and become more satisfied and happier in, in the workplace by really looking at things differently and finding ways to do what we love and at the very least having impact on other people. And I know we'll come to this because I know a little bit about your story. That doesn't mean we should stay forever if the working conditions are horrible or we're in a really toxic organization. There is a time to make a shift. But the first mm -hmm. thing you want to do is say, what can I do? How am I trapping myself in unhappiness and what can I do to get out of it? I love it. Well, that right there would set us up for hours and hours. And yeah, so this is, the, this is the teaser to the listeners. We're going to talk about all of this on this episode, but I did want to lay a little bit of a foundation because you've written a number of books. You do a lot of things, teaching, and I, I read a lot about it. You know, you mentioned you were cleaning houses. What got you here and why? <laughs> so, another good question. It, the way I look at life, everyone has a story. We show up in our professional garb and we go to work and we deal with each other on sort of a superficial way. But if you look under the surface, every single person has a story. And I have a story too. I, I didn't go to college when most people do at 18. I set off to discover the world and on the way got married and started having children and frankly was very, very poor. And that was fine for a while. And then it started not being so fine. And so late in my 20s, after the birth of my third child, I, I went to college and just got on fire learning about, it was, I was studying psychology. I was learning about people and I decided to continue with that. Um, mind you, I needed a job, but I also needed to have enough education to get a good job. I knew that by that time. So fast forward a few years, you know, I'll get a doctorate in this and that. And, and I have balanced my life for many years now, um, teaching and consulting and coaching. So I've almost always had um, some kind of an affiliation with a university where I can work with students, usually executive students, you know, people probably like your listeners who are a little bit older um, and maybe coming back to school for a master's or a doctorate while they work. But I also have um, managed to keep my hand in in the corporate world and in fact actually started a company and consulted almost full time for many, many years. Right now I'm back to bigger foot in uh, academia as and uh, still a solid footing out in the real world. I think that balance really helps me to understand what's really going on. You hear about the ivory tower and people not understanding what people, others really experience in the workplace. That can happen because research can be so esoteric mm -hmm. and I don't want that to happen to me. So I, I try to back up the reading and the writing and all that I do with an approach that says, let's translate this. So Absolutely everybody can use what we're learning about not only how to be happy at work, but about emotional intelligence and leadership and some of the other things that I and my colleagues have been writing about for a long time. Yeah, it's funny what you say about the research getting esoteric. I hear that often about how researchers just end up writing for other researchers and they leave the real reason anyone should be doing it kind of on the shelf. They do, Chris, and I probably have been guilty of this uh, myself on occasion. That's partly how our universities are set up. People in universities, faculty in universities, are rewarded for doing research and publishing in in journals in their field, in academic journals in their field. Those journals are not meant for us, ordinary human beings. They are meant for other academics. So the readership is pretty narrow by definition, and and they're often written in a way that's you know, not all that palatable for those of us who, you know, have normal jobs and that sort of thing. So the, the, the lovely, wonderful gems that are in fact discovered in research aren't always translated and um, projected out into the world that in a way that I think they can and should be. Now that, that doesn't mean they, that never happens. Of course it does. There are a number sure. of us who are committed to making sure that what we're learning in psychology and anthropology and even neuroscience is translated. And we, you know, we take these ideas and we don't simplify them. We just make them easier to access so that they make sense and make sure that the application of these ideas uh, really makes sense to people and so they can use them. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad there's people bridging that gap. 
I know you do executive coaching and <laughs> that has always fascinated me in the sense that, A, I know a lot of people who coach, many call themselves executive coaches and you never know. And I know your experience level. So my question is, one, why do these executives need so many coaches? <laughs> and two, what do most of them hire you for? Executive coaching didn't exist in, in the world as a field until about, let's say, 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, something um, in that neighborhood. And um, that didn't mean people didn't talk to other individuals and get advice and, and support and all that sort of thing. They did. But it, it's kind of exploded on the landscape, as you know, as a real field that is professionalizing. And that's a good thing because there are frankly, a lot of people who hang out a shingle and say executive coach, and they haven't had any uh, exposure to either psychology or coach training or, or any of the other things that are really necessary if you're going to, frankly, mess around with somebody else's life, because that's what you're doing. You People come to trust you in the coaching relationship, and they will tell you things, and they're looking for support and sometimes advice. And we better know what we're doing when it comes to human psychology and human development when we are working with people like that. And, and I'm not sure that that many people do more and more as, as this field professionalizes. I'm really thrilled to see we're getting more and more really good coaches. I know you have coached in the past, Chris, and I know you yeah. have spent the time it takes to make sure that these services you're providing for people are good, solid uh, services that you can be proud of and that they can actually benefit from. So that's what we need. Mm -hmm. Now, why do people, why do people, so many executives need so many coaches? That's another great question. I think one of the reasons is because the coaching relationship is safe when it's at its best. It is confidential. You can say anything you want and you know it's not going to go back to your boss or your colleagues or, you know, people who work for you. And you can work on things that maybe are a little bit scary, you know, those those things that you know you're not as good at as you'd like to be. Or, or, or you know, on the other side of that coin, you can celebrate the successes you've had with less constraint in the context of that relationship. And we can learn a lot, by the way, from understanding our successes and celebrating them. So I think part of the reason it's so effective and so widespread um, is that when coaches are at their best and when that relationship is really thriving, it is safe, it is open. Um, a coach comes to understand the organizational context, the culture, the climate, as well as the players, and can really help their clients in an environment where the clients don't have to be withholding or self-protective or any of those things that actually get in the way of learning. So learning happens really well in that environment when it's done at its best. Yeah, I can imagine. And also that old phrase, it's lonely at the top, I think really comes into play in what you said, that trust being built. I know a lot of executives with the stress and the exterior that they have to put on. When you combine all those, it's hard to find an outlet at times. And then that's when you come in. Yeah, that's when all of us come in when we're coaching. And you're right. It's lonely at the top. And it's actually lonely quite a, quite far down the organization. Yeah. Every, every person who ever steps into a leadership role is essentially putting themselves in a position where others are going to be watching them very carefully, especially the people who work for them. Why? Because you as a manager, you as a leader, actually do have a lot of impact on other people's lives from when they go on vacation to what their next project is going to be or even their next job. So you're kind of in the spotlight. And in many cases, you are not going to have the kind of relationships where you can be completely, totally yourself. Although I make an argument that most managers, most employees, most leaders can really grow in the authenticity area. I think we keep a lot under wraps that we don't have to keep under wraps in the workplace. And that's part of the stress. You alluded to it, you know, how we show up, that game face and all of that. It, it, I mean, people can smell that a mile away and know when it's false. And I think we could really, really improve our experience of work if we'd be a little bit more real and have slightly different and deeper re relationships with people. But as it stands now, many organizations make it unsafe for people to do that. So yes, um, in comes a coach. And over time, as that relationship grows over the first couple of months and trust is established, 
then the manager, the leader can really start saying, okay, you know, there's something I wanted to talk about that I can't really talk about with people here because I'm not sure where it would go. And my family's great and I can talk to them about it, but they don't totally understand because they're not here. And same with my friends. Um, so maybe you can, you can have that conversation with me. And, and that really is beneficial. Absolutely. Well, one of the things you touched on, it was exactly where I wanted to go next. I can't believe you brought it up. Was this idea of kind of putting on the game face and really at the core of it, authenticity. I'll never forget. And I've used this analogy a few times, but the first year I entered the workforce in that, you know, Fortune 100 company where you're wearing the suit or the dress clothes, all that. I uh, the the only analogy I could use was I felt like an alien. Because mm -hmm. I don't, I really do not have the capacity to change who I am at work versus who I am at home. I've never, I've never had it. I, I literally can't do it. And so it felt so trying and so odd to me that it was like I walked on to a different planet. And what I've learned over the years is I think it served me well because at first people are like, wow, this guy, you know, kind of. It's just who he is. But I think it's drawn people in a little bit and then opened them up. Where did this idea come from that we have to be two separate people? That is an interesting question. Uh, I think it comes from a couple of places. One has to do with how we think about work in general and the kind of basic assumptions or the beliefs that we hold about work that... I don't know whether they came from our grandfathers and our grandmothers or the last century or where they came from, but they're things like um, work is work. It's not supposed to be fun or you've got a job. Stop complaining uh, or don't bring your feelings to work. Uh, leave that stuff at the doorstep. And the reality, all of those are myths that are, at least in our modern day, and frankly, I think a long time ago too, really destructive because they they do what you describe. They make people hide who they are and the effort it takes to hide who you are. There's even a word for it. It's called covering. Kenji Yoshino and Christy Smith are two absolutely fantastic writers and researchers who have um, written about this thing called covering. When at, in, at work and in the workplace, we feel like we have to cover core aspects of ourselves. And of course, you can imagine um, things like race and gender um, are mentioned in these studies and what people, you know, they've surveyed lots and lots of people. And I've even got a wonderful doctor, doctoral student doing a study on this right now. Um, obvious things are covered, but it's really interesting to note that even people who you might consider um, the majority in the workplace, white, male, et cetera, uh, those individuals also report covering who they are, covering things like, I really have a different personality than what's called for in here, or I'm having some trouble at home and I've got to not let anybody know about that. Mm. Or I, you know, really don't buy into this culture quite as much as everybody else. I've got to hide that. It takes so much energy and it's so stressful to hide who you are. And Chris, I know you've got a lot of questions, but just one last thing on this. It's not to say that we can go to the workplace and be fully, wholly ourselves every moment in the day. We are, we are working with uh, people who are different from ourselves. And we've got to find, we've got to negotiate and find common ground, um, find ways to bring our values together to find common shared values so that it feels good to work together. We feel like we are in sync and part of the same tribe. Um, understand people's experiences. We all come from different places. We all have that story behind us that I talked about, as well as, you know, the, the different experiences that we might have gotten as a result of growing up female or growing up in China, as opposed to Germany or the United States or whatever it is. So it's, it's all about curiosity and then determining how can I be myself in this environment? And once we're able to do that, literally our brains work better because all that energy that was pouring into that act of covering is now available to help us think and create and innovate. 
we can get into that prefrontal cortex and out of our limbic system, right? That's it. That's exactly <laughs> where all that good stuff happens. The prefrontal cortex, where we um, process emotions, where we understand, where we empathize, where we understand mm -hmm. other people, right? Where we make reasoned judgments based on the data that we've taken in and actually processed. And if we're locked into our limbic system and and trapped in an amygdala hijack, uh, that mm -hmm. prefrontal cortex just plain doesn't work as well. Well, and this kind of also dovetails nicely into this idea of happiness at work. And what I what I find so almost refreshing about your book is, you know, not only do you get permission to be happy and but you use the H word. Right. And I think so often it's almost no, no, no. Just don't say that. Say anything else. Say engage, say fulfilled, but just don't say happy because it seems so basic. Mm -hmm. um, it's so why, funny, the H word. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, why did you decide to, to say happy and be happy and tell people they can be happy? Well, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, as you probably know, and maybe some of your listeners do, most of my work has been in the area of leadership. And some of our other books with you know, Dan Goldman and Richard Biazas are about emotional intelligence. And I've spent a lot of my life looking at what emotional intelligence is, how do you develop these skills, et cetera. I've also spent a lot of my life looking at organizational culture and the impact of a culture, you know, the values and the habits and the norms on people's ability to do their jobs well. So I was doing that for many, many years. And it, it happened that at one point in time, a few years ago, uh, I had been involved in and led actually a lot of studies of organizations and institutions around the world, looking at leadership practices and culture. And the, the tack we took was to go in and interview quite a lot of people. And this is everything from you know, big energy, massive um, energy companies to, you know, government, uh, provincial governmental offices in sub-Saharan office uh, Africa to uh, media to pharmacy, you, you name it. And we we touched on it. And I, I thought to myself, you know, I think we're missing something here. Yeah, we found out a lot about leadership. We found out a lot about emotional intelligence. We found out a lot about culture. But I had this nagging feeling that we were missing something. So I went back to all these studies. There were probably about 35 of them. And I just started reading again, reading the interviews. And, you know, it's kind of funny because some of them were done in Zulu or Chinese or Italian. And I was reading, you know, um, transcribed and translated interviews. But I really could get the gist of it. And, of course, a lot were in English, too. And what was screaming at me from these many interviews when I took my own blinders off and said, what are people trying to tell us? The answer was crystal clear. People were saying, clear as day, I want to love my job. My job's really important to me. My workplace is really important to me. I want to be happy. I want to feel that I'm having impact. I want to be hopeful. I want to have great relationships. It was clear as day what people say they need in order to be effective in the workplace. It's not just a nice to have, to have although of course we all I think do want to be happy. It's also about effectiveness and productivity and getting things done collaboratively. So I started looking at a re-looking at, I guess, um, what other people had written about happiness at work and positive psychologists like Sean Aker and a number of other really cool people. And lo and behold, uh, in the last 10 years or so, the research on the importance of actual happiness is exploding in both the academic sphere and the corporate or the institution organizational spheres. So I had my own case for why happiness was important, and it melded perfectly with the research that had also been done by other people in other ways. So I just decided, let me take a chance and just say it out loud. Happiness matters. And if we're looking at engagement, what is it? Does happiness have a part in that or not? And at this point in time, we've got again, some really interesting studies going on, one of my doctoral students in particular, about the relationship between happiness engage and engagement. And we think it's there. Engagement is kind of a word that just gets used over and over. And what are we right. talking about anyway? Sometimes hard to tell. I think it's an obvious tie that happiness leads to engagement, right? And I, we were talking about it. I've consulted with in the past couple of years, has to be over a hundred, you know, different organizations. And I get to talk with their leaders most of the time, smart people, well-meaning people. But my question is, or, or I guess my statement that I would throw to you is oftentimes it's as if, although they know what kind of environment they need to create, they don't create it. 
And often it's in fear of being different. So it's like, yes, I realize our people are overworked, but that's just how it is. We have to hit our quarters. We have to do this. I, I find a disconnect between the game that people talk and leaders talk and the actual culture that they build at their organization. Do you see similar things? I see that disconnect so clearly, Chris. Uh, I come from a viewpoint that most people intend to do good and to do well at work, leaders, employees alike, all the way up and down the hierarchy. And yet, So many people do not reach their potential, especially when it comes to things like creating the right kind of environment for um, themselves and other people to do and be their best. And, and, you know, I ask myself the question, why? I do think, frankly, that the stress and pressure of of our organizations is very real. I mean, if you look over the last 10 to 15 years, um, you know, you had the bubble of the early 2000s in in the business sector, and and that spreads elsewhere too. Then you have the crash, the Great Recession. Then you have this massive rebuilding. And and yet, in many cases where organizations had downsized, they're not refilling those positions. So people are working what used to be two jobs, or it used to be three jobs. That, and there's, you know, I'm a I love technology. I love new gadgets, but we carry our work in our pockets, right? And I'm sure many of your listeners do what a lot of people do. And even I have to fight the urge in the middle of the night, the cell phone's right there, attempting to pick it up and see if somebody's texted you. Certainly first thing in the morning, that's what a lot of people do. So our work is available to us all the time. And especially if you love your job, the possibility of getting stressed to the max and even burned out is really high these days. So that's one of the reasons for the disconnect. When we're stressed like that, Chris, there's no way we can be at our best. Our minds, our brains don't work right. And it's all we can do sometimes to make sure we get through our own day, much less think about planning, you know, how to make sure other people get through their days well. We just don't do it as well as we could or should when we're in that in that condition. And then then there are those myths again, this notion that, well, I shouldn't be I shouldn't be friends with the people at work because I need to be objective. Well, yeah, you need to be objective. And yeah, you need to have really good relationships with people where there's trust and an ability to have a laugh together and maybe have some fun. That's what is needed if we're going to do a really good job. And and yet people tend to conform and go along with these old myths and the, this old mindset that work shouldn't be fun. And it all, it, it's just professional. Remember, you know, all these cliches that we hear that are actually getting in our way. And now a quick word from this week's sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Blinkist. In today's age, it can be hard to find the time to sit down and learn, especially when the likes of social media can be so addictive and time consuming. So you may think that you don't have time to read a book or to develop yourself. Well, think again. Blinkist is the only app that condenses thousands of nonfiction books into the best key takeaways and need-to-know information. So you can read or listen to them in just 15 minutes. 8 million people are using Blinkist right now, and it has a massive and growing library. From self-help, business, health, to history books. I love Blinkist because in less than 15 minutes, I feel like I can fast track my path to a more informed me. There's so many awesome books on there. Take one of our previous guests, Simon Sinek, and his book, Start With Why. All right, so listen up. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for the listeners of Smart People Podcast. Go to Blinkist.com slash smart to start your free seven-day trial. Again, that's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com slash smart to start your free seven-day trial. Don't forget it, Blinkist dot com slash smart. And now back to the episode. You talk about actually things getting in our way. And, and what I loved about your book is you talk about how, look, we have to take some responsibility for our happiness at work. And you go through five different happiness traps. So you have overwork, ambition, money, the shoulds, and the helplessness. Tell us a little bit about those happiness traps, how you identified them, and how they weigh on us and our happiness 
at work. Yes, I, I did put forth in the book uh, some ways we can take responsibility for our own happiness. The way I came to that, Chris, was again going back to all those interviews and those studies from all over the world. You know, one of my first questions was, well, if people want to be happy and they know it makes them better at what they do, why aren't we happy? And you'll you'll hear if you ask people a lot of kind of finger pointing. Well, it's my boss. I can't stand my boss. Or it's that person on my team. You know, he or she is really a pain. Or I just hired somebody and they're not working out. There's a lot of finger pointing. And those things may be true. Um, I will not minimize the fact that there are toxic bosses out there. They may be true indeed and in our faces all the time. But the fact of the matter is there's a lot we can do ourselves even with a situation in which the um, culture is kind of toxic and the boss isn't that great. So I started looking for how do we get in our own way? And some of the happiness traps are really interesting because on the surface, they look great. Um, but it, if taken too far, they're not. Give me, I'll give you an example. The achievement trap. We all want to achieve. We all want to do well. We want, all want to excel. Most people really do. Uh, want to feel that they're doing their best. And that's great. But when it spins out of control, when you find yourself going after goal after goal, not celebrating the successes along the way, grabbing the next br brass ring, and before you even let go, you're thinking about the next brass ring you've got to grab, you're on a treadmill. And it is a recipe for unhappiness. Um, likewise, doing what we think we should do. Every society, every organization has shoulds. They're about dress. They're about how do you talk to each other. They're about values. They're, you know, it's kind of the grease that keeps the social wheels moving. We need rules. Yeah, we really do. But I think the, the kinds of shoulds that I've seen really turn into a, a happiness trap are the kind that have us make choices about our life and about our work that are counter to our values. Quick story, I was talking with a professor of mine, um, a professor friend of mine recently, and she talked about uh, having a conversation with a few seniors in college who are just coming back from their internships. And to a person, they loved this professor. They were talking very openly with her about how much they hated their internships. And she said, well, what are you going to do? I mean, the offers are probably going to start coming in. And to a person, they all said, well, I think I have to take the job. I really should. You know, I've spent all this time in school. My parents have spent so much money or I've spent so much money. I really should take the job. So these, these young people were getting ready to take jobs they already knew they hated because they thought they should. And honestly, in my consulting and coaching, I've met the equivalent of those people 10, 10 or 15 or 20 years later when they followed the should track the entire time. Because you do get trapped, right? The way, right? You take the job, then you get the nice apartment, and then you get the car, and before you know it, you're trapped. And you know they follow this path, and they wake up sometime around you know 38, 40, 42, or maybe hopefully not, but maybe around 50, and say, "What have I done with my life? This isn't what I wanted to do." That is a trap. Um, that's a trap. Same with money. It's great. It's great. We need it. Uh, I have no problem with money, but it's not going to make us happy. It'll buy us that car and that house and things that we need. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but if you think staying in a job for the money is the way to become happy, think about what happened the last time you got a raise. I bet the glow of that wore off in about two weeks. Or that big bonus, that was really nice <laughs> for about three weeks maybe. Then you forgot about it. Then you're back to the grind. So yeah, yeah, I want everyone to marinate on that thought for a second, just because I have this phrase I use all the time in my workshops, which is common sense is not always common practice. And the thing is, we might say, oh, I know that money's a trap. I know that you know we shouldn't do things just because somebody else, but we do it, myself included, everyone. It's right. human nature. But one of the reasons why we do this podcast, why people listen I mean, the whole purpose of language and knowledge is to pass things along so we don't have to experience them to know what's going to happen. So exactly. I'm just saying to everyone listening, take the doctor and the researcher, Annie McKee, take my life of, you know, doing it and, and having panic attacks kick me out of finance and just recognize that those things aren't worth it. That was my soapbox. 
I think it's a great soapbox, <laughs> and I, I've seen it too often. Uh, I've seen people not leave jobs even when they've got lots of money in the bank. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen people stay in jobs for that next raise or that next bonus or the promotion to get more money when in fact they they you know they're not in sync with the organization and they really don't like what they're doing. And it, you know you can go on like that and and by the way we do at times in our life need to just stick it out. Sometimes mm -hmm. the bills just have to be paid. That's fine. But if that's a way of life then emptiness follows. Mm -hmm. I have another saying. I like your saying too, um, common sense is not always common practice. I say that in my workshops too. <laughs> There's another one that I like and that it's money follows good work, not the other way around. Yeah, you're you right. You do what you love. You do what you love and chances are you're going to be able to do just fine. As long as the you know conditions are right, the economy's okay, and you've got some choice, and you've been learning along the way, so you're not um, essentially sidelining yourself by not keeping up. There's so many areas that I'm I can hear people just saying yes, but what if? Yes, but what if? So I want to cover a, a number of things. The first is let's say I am in uh, this position that I don't enjoy. I'm at a company I don't enjoy. I, I feel stuck. All these things, and I'm hearing this. I'm hearing two people on a conversation go, okay, I deserve happiness at work, but A, B, C, D, E. Where do you start? You start with really delving into yourself. It starts with self-awareness, really allowing yourself to uh, think long and hard about what's important to you, what matters to you, reflecting on times in your life at work or in life in general, when you have felt fulfilled, what were the conditions there? Reflecting on your strengths and your abilities and thinking about times when maybe you've been able to utilize those strengths and abilities, what were the condition there? Um, and, and really allowing yourself, and this is scary, by the way, um, it's really scary to look deep into your own you know, wishes and desires and, and needs, um, but it's really worth it because that's where it starts. So and along with that, Chris comes asking the question, what am I doing that is actually making the situation worse? It's, there's usually something. And I've done this. I have done this. I worked in, in one of my jobs for a really toxic individual who, as far as I could tell, he hated me. And he made my life miserable. Um, I could, I figured that out about six months after I, I was, you know, hired to come in and, and do this thing. I didn't know why. I mean, he was the one who hired me and I really put that all on, on him. And before you know it, we were in a pitched battle and I, I recognized at some point that, you know, my way of coping with it was not helping. It was making him worse. Um, now, ultimately, I did have to make some changes. That was one, the kind of situation that I actually did have to get out of. And they, they do exist, right? If it's really toxic, you've got to get out of these situations. But along the way, there are things that I know I could have done differently. So number one, you look inside, you ask yourself, wh what do I want? And what am I not getting, right? And then how am I getting in my own way? And then if you're like most people, you can't just up and quit. Some people can but most people can't. They need mm -hmm. that little transition time. Then the question becomes, what can I do to make it better right now? Back to the story I told about cleaning houses in my, or in my 20s, right? Is there anything in this that could help me feel the way I want to feel at work? I found a couple of things. And I know that's possible for most of us. If it's a toxic relationship, what can I do to make that relationship better? There are sometimes things you can do. And at the very least, you can create some, what I think of as psychological boundaries so that person or those people don't destroy your self-esteem. Put up some barriers. Don't let them get to you. So there are some things we can do while we're you know, transitioning out, if that is the choice we ultimately want to make. And surprisingly, when we do these things, things often get better and maybe we're not so keen to leave or maybe we're not going to leave the company entirely, but maybe we're going to move to a different part of the company or work for somebody different. Options start opening up when we think about it that way. I find it really fascinating how you talk about just taking ownership and changing the things you can control. I think that's a really high level task. It's it's not easy, but it is also perhaps the most beneficial and again, the one we have the most 
ability to, to change. In your experience, what do you see is most common where people are really just kind of self-sabotaging? What are the things you, you see most often that people are doing that they're unaware of and that if they just took some steps, they could make their work environment better and perhaps even great? Let me think about that. One of the things that I see that really does look like self-sabotage is when people decide, maybe unconsciously, but they decide to go with the negative energy, the negative talk, the cynicism that is prevalent in most organizations somewhere. You know, instead of finding the optimists and hanging with the people who are looking to make the place better, you find yourself hanging with the naysayers, the complainers, the people who really don't have anything good to say about anything. That will bring you down faster than you can say boo. And that's because emotions are contagious and you're going to pick it up. Even if you were kind of like on the fence, hang out with people like that. You're going to become cynical. You're going to become negative, And ultimately, you're not doing yourself or anybody else a favor. I, I see it a lot. And it, it, what do we do with these people who are, are truly negative and if not toxic, then certainly hard to be around? You can try to build a relationship with them, try to connect with them. They are human beings after all, and they're obviously unhappy, right? And try to bring them around. You're not always going to succeed. And if you're really not going to succeed, it, you know, um, yes, you can work with them, but that's when you put some of those barriers up, right? You, maybe you have to work with them, but you don't have to get into the conversation about the boss, so to speak, or complain about the strategy of the company being vague. You don't have to go there. And I do see a lot of people get stuck and trapped in the negativity that you can find if you look for it in any organization you want to name. You lay out three things, purpose, hope, and friendships, which are really the three core components of happiness at work. I could not uh, agree more. I think you're spot on. The friendships part seems incredibly logical. Look, if you work with people you like and so much so that you have a relationship that would extend even beyond work, man, that's going to go a long ways. Hope we might be able to touch on, but purpose, I have an issue with for this. How can we say to a world of 7 billion people or a country of hundreds of millions, hey, you are entitled to a job in which you feel there is purpose? Because I feel like if we say that the pressure on somebody who's you know, sweeping floors or who knows what else becomes great. What would you say to that? This idea that, you know, purpose, although it makes sense, seems to me to be too lofty of a goal. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, there may be a lot of people who feel that way. And, and I would come back with this, Chris, that human beings are meaning making creatures. We try to make sense of the world around us, of what we're doing, of our lives, of our work. We also want to have impact on people around us. I, I have never met a person who really doesn't care unless they are so deep in this land of cynicism that they've lost all hope. I've never met a person who really doesn't care whether what they do matters. You, you can go back even to Vic, Victor Frankl's book, uh, A Man's Search for Meaning, where he talks about creating a sense of meaning and purpose in the concentration camps in Nazi Germany, where he was imprisoned as a youth. Mm -hmm. And I say to myself, well, that's interesting. If, if somebody can and finds the need to find purpose in that kind of situation, finds the need to, let me look at, you know, less dire and drastic and horrible situations like the workplace and see what it means there. And what it means in the workplace is finding a way to be able to express some of our values, ones that are important to us, values like, you know, human dignity is important to me, or compassion and kindness is important to me. We can do that in any job whatsoever. Having an impact is really important. You mentioned sweeping floors. I have a friend who um, unfortunately had a family member, a very young family member who was very, very sick and in children's hospital for a long time. And it, it, they came to realize over the many months and years that this child was in and out of the hospital that you know, doctors come and go. Doctors have a really purposeful, meaningful profession, right? Nurses come and go, purposeful, meaning profession. The person who didn't come and go was the janitor who came in at 11 o'clock every night, had a couple of words with this child 
um, who was lying in the bed and a smile and that sort of thing. And, you know, the studies show that people who transform and reframe how they think about their work, I didn't talk to that man personally, but I'm willing to bet he saw as part of his job, um, keeping an environment clean for those little children so they could get better, having a smile and cheering some child up. I bet anything he saw that as part of his work. And there have been studies that have shown that to be absolutely true. You know, I've talked to people who work in, you know, big companies that farm potatoes. Well, who's going to be, a um, you know, major buyer of potatoes? It's going to be fast food restaurants. Some people might not find that so meaningful. I remember one gentleman, I had this conversation and he felt really at a loss uh, because he didn't feel that the values of the company or what it was doing really was in sync with what he felt mattered until he really looked around in his company and found that, in fact, in addition to the growing potatoes and selling to the fast food chains, et cetera, they were also developing um, fertilizers and way, ways of growing foods that were less harmful to the planet and more accessible to people in poorer parts of the of the world. And he was able to transform himself and actually enter that part of the organization. We can find it in most organizations. And at the very least, you talked about having friends and liking the people we work with. It's really important. You know, mentoring somebody, uh, caring about somebody else's career, help, giving somebody a leg up, helping them along the way, that alone can provide a sense of meaning and purpose to our, our lives at work. Something is really important, even when you know much of what we're doing maybe doesn't fit exactly with who we are. And so when we think of purpose, again, it sounds like it's take a little bit of ownership of what that means. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that the organization's purpose has to perfectly align with yours. I'm sure you advocate for some alignment, but it's finding that purpose in the way Viktor Frankl did, um, and in the way many people do in the smaller things that they do. So you look, you tend to look at purpose on maybe a, a micro level or an individual level. And that via the research shows to increase happiness. Is that correct? It, it does. You've said it okay. beautifully, Chris. The, um, our job is to figure out what matters to us back to self-awareness and then find ways to manifest that, to do that, to be that in the workplace. No organization mission or vision is going to completely fulfill us. Maybe for a while in a startup or maybe when you first start a job, you're really enamored with what the company is doing, but you're going to see the warts sooner or later right? Oh, <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, the job then becomes, can I figure out how to live my purpose within this context, within the, the framework of this company? Is there enough mm. here? I do, I do really hope that people can find some overlap between what they care about and what the organization does. Um, if it's completely different, it's very hard to stay for the long term, right? Um, yeah. If you really care about the environment and you're working for a company that is systematically and deliberately destroying the environment, you're going to have problems, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's usually, it's usually possible to find some overlap. And yes, I do look at it in a more micro way. What can we do on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis to make ourselves um, feel that it, we are living our values and having positive impact on something or someone we care about? I love that because one of the things I've always struggled with is I've never been able to buy into, quote unquote, corporate vision. You know, when when somebody gets on stage and rah, rah, here's why we do what we do. Here's our mission statement. And this is for large companies specifically. I've never fully been able to buy in because I always am thinking in the back of my head, look, that might be it. But every quarter you're just grinding people out to hit your numbers for Wall Street or right. whatever it is. And call me cynical, right? And I've, I've since grown. I mean, that's why I work for the company I work for now. That's why and we didn't really talk about this, but the way I got out of my head and my stress was I helped found a nonprofit, which was based entirely on one of my life's passions. And, you know, I guess I'm saying all this because to those listening, one of the things I've found you have to do is determine which of these things, whether it be purpose, hope, friendships, money, flexibility, et cetera, which of them matter most? Mm -hmm. Because whatever that is, you will not be able to sacrifice. That's so true. That's so true. You've, you've got to really delve deep and, and really dig and try to 
clarify for yourself in my book, there are a whole bunch of exercises that people can do on their own to really help with that process. What matters to me? What are my strengths? What do I need to have in my work environment and how can I get it? Um, that really, that kind of self-awareness and then the courage to stand up and say, I'm going to try to make it happen. That's really powerful really powerful. And I'm with you, you know, most publicly traded for-profit organizations, well, they have to make money or they go out of business, right? right. It's not right. that making money is bad. It's that it often overshadows whatever purpose the organization actually has. And you've got to be on the lookout for that if you work in a company like that to make sure that the overshadowing isn't causing the company and you to compromise on core values. Right. Well, and I'm so glad you mentioned it because you do have really incredible exercises in here. It's, it's actually a shame. I wish I would have read this book about 14 years ago. I think I would have saved myself some hardships because you also talk about things like recognizing the physical and emotional warning signs of not being in a place that you enjoy or on the right track. So I just want to say that to follow up on what you said that you know, it's not, this is not just an academic exercise in happiness. This is a, a literal how to with the backings of research. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, was that something you felt was a contribution you wanted to make to society, to those reading, to help them find this happiness, not, not just explain what they can do to get there? Absolutely. And, and I said, I think earlier in our conversation that, Part of my mission, as I see it anyway, and, and part of the mission that I really care about is making sure that what we learn about some of these concepts that can seem kind of distant, even ha things like happiness or emotional intelligence becomes ultimately practical and real and concrete. It's not just something to talk about. It's something to do. It's something to work on being. And I'm hopeful that some of what I've written and some of these exercises and that sort of thing, people tell me it helps them to actually take steps toward making their lives and their work lives better. And that means something to me. You talk about purpose, that matters to me. I really, yeah. I really want to share whatever, whatever I can in whatever way I can, uh, ideas and practices and concepts and you know things that you can do to make your work life and your life better. Absolutely. Well, with the few minutes we have left, I did want to touch on hope because I've found how powerful it can be in, in an instant to switch you from perhaps despair or depression or even just stress in a job, how it can switch you right to happiness and fulfillment or at least a positive outlook. When you recognize the hope, when you see the, the progress or what you're working towards, if you could tell people what you've learned about the power of hope, but even more importantly, how you recommend people go about finding that hope, looking for it and understanding it. Mm. Anyone listening who's ever had something bad happen in their lives, and we all have, right? Relationships and people get sick, people pass away, people die, right? We've all had things happen to us. And then there are bigger things, you know, national dis uh, disaster, environmental disasters and those kind of things. Um, we've all had bad things happen. And when those things happen, what we realize is that hope is what gets us up in the morning and has us put one foot in front of the other. Tomorrow's going to be better than today. I just know it is. And that gives me the strength to continue. And this, I think it's an, it's an endemic part of being human. I think it's one of the things that makes us so special, this capacity to imagine a better future, even if we can't really see it. And that gives us the strength and the intellect to keep going. So I think it's really important. How can we do it? One of the things that's really important is to look at what kind of future you want. You as a human being, not your company, not your manager, not even your career, but what do you want? Annie, it's been such an honor to talk to you. This is a this is a, a topic that is so near and dear to my heart, and I'm happy to share it. Your book is How to Be Happy at Work, The Power of Purpose, Hope, and Friendships. Uh, before I let you go, I just wanted to see 
you know, aside from the book, is there anywhere else that you are, you're writing, you're talking, you're tweeting that you want to let our listeners know about so they can follow you along? Oh, yeah. You can find me on Twitter, Annie McKee, and definitely check out my website. You can find all my social media platforms there and a lot of short readings that you can just download and, you know, kind of get a dose of something without diving into a whole book. And they're all free. So just go ahead, AnnieMcKee.com, and you'll find some things that I think will be really helpful and very practical. And another episode in the books. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Annie McKee. Annie's book, How to Be Happy at Work, The Power of Purpose, Hope, and Friendship, can be found at your local bookstore and on Amazon. And as I'm sure you've heard me say almost 300 plus times now, if you decide to purchase any of the books on the show through Amazon, please make sure to use the Smart People Podcast Amazon link located at smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. That'll take you right to Amazon with our referral code. You just do all your shopping like you normally would, and we get a nice little kickback from Amazon that greatly helps support the show. If you're looking for other free and easy ways to help out the show, head over to Apple Podcasts or iTunes and leave a rating and review for us. And just a quick story. You might have noticed that we haven't been in iTunes for the last week, but we are back in there now. So now we need your help. We need some ratings. We need some reviews. So if you can help us out with that, we'd greatly appreciate it. And don't forget, head over to smartpeoplepodcast.com and check out old episodes, sign up for the newsletter, and scope out the Instagram feed. All right, that's it for us this week. Make sure you stay tuned because we got a lot of good interviews coming up, and we will see you all next episode. This week's episode was brought to you by Blinkist. In today's age, it can be hard to sit down and learn more. You may think you don't have time to read a book. Well, think again. Blinkist is the only app that condenses thousands of nonfiction books into the best key takeaways. So you can read or listen to them in just 15 minutes. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for the listeners of Smart People Podcast. Go to Blinkist.com slash smart to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, dot com slash smart to start your free seven day trial. Again, blinkist dot com slash smart. <laughs>